everybody. It's Dr. Joe uh, on this Wednesday evening. I hope it's well where you, wherever you are and um, here in the D.C. area. The weather's a little get, getting better. A um, little under the weather. I uh, have a little sore throat, so um, my voice may sound a little raspy. Uh, if it is, then I apologize, but uh, I'll, I'll solve they say, and, uh, and so on. So again, uh, excuse my voice. It sounds if it's a little raspy, but uh, I'll do the best that I can given the circumstances and uh and so on so um okay hope all is well where you are and uh so today we're going to talk about the top 10 ways to lower your risk as a real estate and uh, i hold the investor and uh it's going to be quite an interesting session and i'm going to share with you some of my uh suggestions um to reduce the risk because you know buy and hold uh any, any any kind of investing really is uh is there is some level of risk and real estate is no different and uh, and so as a buy and hold investor, there are specific risks that I think is worthy for me to share with you. And that's going to be the focus of today's session. I'm going to kind of go through uh, at least my uh, top 10, uh, if you want to call it that. And, uh, and then we'll keep on going. So with that said and done, let's, let's roll. So the title, as you can see here, is the top 10 ways to lower your risk as a buy and hold investor. We all know what buy and hold investing is. Uh, you know me. Uh, it's essentially, my strategy is to buy it, fix it up, force value, force appreciation, and hold on to this thing indefinitely, uh, or at least 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and let time do most of the heavy lifting. And, uh, and hopefully, uh, I can be the beneficiary of time over the long haul. So that's uh, what I've decided to do. That's my strategy uh it's work it's you know we've had some ups and downs but uh again i'm going to talk about some of the mistakes uh that i've made and some of the things that you can do to reduce your risk as a buy and hold investor so uh okay let's go so one of the um advantages of real estate investing is uh it's really predictability of the real estate investing returns as i said to you before if you buy onto it hold it for a while time is very very forgiving on 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 real estate something that you may think you've overpaid today uh five years from now you wish you bought more uh at the same price that you did five years earlier and uh you may have sort of regretted buying something uh year one but year 10 10 years on you probably think it's probably the best thing that you've done for most people real estate uh if they own their own property they probably realize that real estate is probably one of the best investments that they've had. So, um, you know, that's not too, um, especially when compared to uh, other investment uh, assets, for example, stocks uh, and bonds and other securities. Um, there's, there's some risk associated with that. Um, the reason why, although I have some stocks uh, in various companies and uh, I'm not a real a, a firm pro, uh, proponent of that uh, in the sense that uh, it's just control. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot of control over uh, the stock price uh, of the investments that I have in securities. For example, it's a good example in terms of volatility. Uh, we all know that uh, a couple of days ago, uh, was it in Fox News, uh, Tucker Carlson, I think, he, he was fired. And, um, you know, I mean, that's not the purpose of this discussion. But uh, he was fired, and the stock price of Fox News or Fox Corporation went down by uh, two to three percent just by him being fired. So there's a certain level of volatility, a certain level of um, you know things beyond your control when you own real when you own stocks. So, but then with that said and done, in terms of real estate, there is there are, as I said before, there are risks. And, um, and uh, you know, if you have bad tenants, if you have bad contractors, uh, if you have the tenants from hell, uh, there's risk in that. And uh, as I said before, real estate is not risk free. But I'm going to go through some of the, um, the top 10 ways whereby you can lower your risk. Let's, uh, let's kind of get going. So number one, invest for cash flow and appreciation if possible and uh, i know this is a a, a, a long-standing debate for a lot of people uh if they're going to invest should they invest for cash flow or should they invest for appreciation if possible and uh i say 
you can reduce your risks if you invest for both. Okay, so you shouldn't have to choose either or. But if possible, try to do both. I know it's not always possible in all markets, but that's one of the ways where you can reduce your risk. Uh, let's kind of talk about that. Cash flow, obviously, you want to make sure that your asset that you're buying can support itself. And, uh, you know, it can take care of uh, the expenses. It's nice, obviously, if it uh, generates significant cash flow, positive cash flow. But I know when you first start out, especially when the price is so high these days, it's not always possible to get a high cash flow. And that's where I, I talk about the appreciation as well, is that, uh, in my opinion, based on my experience, the real money, the real money is the appreciation. Yes, it's nice to get a few hundred bucks uh, in cash flow every month, but the real money is buying this asset, holding on to for a number of years, and then exiting with several thousands of dollars or even hundreds of thousands of dollars of appreciation uh, over the long haul. So if you can do both, that's the way to go, and that's how you reduce your risk. And uh, you can't obviously blindly uh, assume that there is appreciation because it's not. And the markets goes up and down uh, through cycles. And there are good times, there are bad times. But if you can hold on to this thing, as I said earlier on, time usually can be it can be a, a big, big uh, helper on uh, in your regard. So over the long haul, prices usually don't tend to go up. So if you can leverage the two, which is appreciation, i.e. hold on to this asset for a long time and getting the benefits of appreciation, but also getting the benefits of cash flow, i.e. the assets you support itself, then that's, the, that's in my opinion, is the one of the best ways to reduce your risk. The asset can support itself. Uh, you've got some really good tenants. You know how to manage those tenants. You know how to manage those relationships, which I'll talk about later on. Uh, but also you'll get the benefits of appreciation in the long haul. Cash flow can be somewhat predictable. Um, I think I, I was speaking last week at a real estate uh, investor uh, meeting. I think I gave you the story for those who attended. The very first house that I bought, I was making $50 in cash flow. And uh, it was a struggle. I had tenants from hell. and It was difficult. Uh, but I hold on to, held on to this thing. And uh, fast forward a few years, uh, that $50 cash flow is now $4,000 cash flow and uh, the appreciation has been significant. So again, uh, if I had just chosen cash flow as the primary driver, I would have probably never, never have bought that house because there was really no cash flow, but cash flow I was able to get over time by increasing the rents and also by paying down the mortgage. Okay, and obviously there's other benefits of real estate ownership as well, which uh, we don't need to discuss about here. But cash flow is something that you can um, definitely you can work to, and it's definitely more predictable, uh, especially if you know how to manage the property, and also if you buy in areas whereby there's uh, good rent growth. So one way to minimize your risk is to invest for both cash flow and appreciation. Hopefully that's number one. Let's talk about number two way to reduce your risk. And uh, really, you I like, kind of learned this the hard way. Uh, use conservative estimates for expenses. Use conservative estimates for expenses. I think uh, one of the most common rookie mistakes is underestimating expenses, underestimating what it's really going to cost you uh, to either acquire this expense uh, asset or hold on to this asset. Uh, many times, um, you know, we we don't factor in. We just say, okay, well, if I buy it for this and the mortgage is that and the rent is that, then the rent minus the expense, um, the rent minus mortgage is 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 is, is, uh, is the cash flow. When in fact, there are other expenses that you need to factor in. For example, vacancies. There are cost of vacancies, maintenance, repairs. Property management, if you uh, give it to a third party, property taxes, insurance, you know, a holding cost. And so there's a lot of expenses that, uh, that are sort of hidden to a certain extent. And, uh, and you have to factor those in if you want to really determine what your cash flow is. So, again, that's a rookie mistake is that you um, either ignore or you don't take into account some of these expenses 
And therefore, really, the profits that you're making is not really what it is that you thought it was going to be. For example, uh, let's give you an example for a vacancy. Uh, you know me, I don't like vacancies. I have my, my systems are set up whereby I'm trying to strive for zero vacancies, i.e. zero turnover. What does that mean? It means that I try to keep my uh, tenants stay there for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Therefore, I have no vacancy. Now, if you have a vacancy, let's say once a year uh, for one month, then uh, then that which means that one twelfth of the year uh, you have a vacancy. So your vacancy rate is eight percent. Okay, which is one divided by twelve times a hundred is just over eight percent. So that's your vacancy cost. You have to factor that in into determining your expenses. In addition to all the other stuff like maintenance, repairs, property management, taxes, insurance, and so forth. Okay, so be careful to make sure that you factor in all the uh, expenses to really determine how much uh, cash flow you're actually making. Number three, a uh, way to reduce, minimize your risk is um, avoid low end rentals. Now, the, I'm sure some, some of you may uh, debate me on this one, which is okay. I'm just sharing you experience. Uh, low end means like war zone. That's what I'm, when I say low end, I'm talking about uh, in war zone neighborhoods, Areas whereby, you know, it's just, uh, you know, there's just boarded up everywhere. And you may have one house here, one house there, and so on. Um, I mean, you can do, you can make money, um, you know, buying in sort of low-end war zone areas. In fact, uh, there was this guy who had a course on that. Uh, war zone riches, he calls it. Um, because on paper, it looks very, very attractive. Your costs are low, i.e. the cost of acquire. You can buy houses for five, ten, fifteen thousand, twenty thousand dollars. You may be able to get a thousand, eight hundred, nine hundred, a thousand dollars in rent. So, you know, in theory, in paper, you can make quite significant uh, cash flow. Uh, your ROI can be quite high because your costs, your debt, your mortgages, your expenses, or well, your your mortgages, uh, is very low. But that's on the plus side. On the negative side or the downside is that uh, there's a lot of other hidden expenses that you're going to incur in uh, in sort of uh, low end neighborhoods. You, you're probably going to have a lot more turnover. Uh, not everybody wants to live there. Most people don't. Uh, and once they can get out, they do get out. Uh, you know, you probably have higher maintenance management costs. Uh, there's a lot more headaches. A lot more, um, you know, drama that you have to deal with, and um, you know, yeah. I mean, you may think, well, well, Dr. Joe, who are you to talk about? You're you're a Section Eight landlord. Uh, yes, I am a Section Eight landlord in the sense that I rent to Section Eight vouchers holders, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm buying in quote unquote Section Eight neighborhoods. Now, there's nothing wrong with Section Eight neighborhoods. Uh, everybody has to live somewhere. Uh, I've just found that uh, if you can buy a product in the better area. Uh, you can usually attract more people. And when people come to your home, they tend to stay there longer. So that's number uh, three. Uh, it's, again, if you have to start, you got to start somewhere. So, I mean, where I started, uh, it wasn't the greatest neighborhood. You got to start somewhere. So if that's all you can afford, so be it. You start there. It's better to start and get into the game than wait and wait and wait until you can afford to buy in the best neighborhoods. Uh, because otherwise you'll be waiting forever. So you can at least start by where you can uh, and then sort of work your way upwards. You're on the train, you're on the journey, you're on the ride now. You can start developing some momentum from which you can then uh, build from that one. So again, if you can, avoid low-end areas. But if you got to start somewhere, start there. So be it. And, uh, and so on. Number four, um, to reduce your risk is to be careful about over leveraging and uh leveraging is you know taking on too much debt and uh as we all know one of the one of the advantages one of the benefits of real estate is your ability to leverage uh i.e i don't know let's say have a ten thousand uh, dollars allow you to buy a hundred thousand dollar property so you can leverage that ten thousand to acquire hundred thousand dollar properties and so on that's on the plus side but uh there is a flip side leverage can be uh, a debt uh 
that's not maintained or managed or uh, carefully considered can be a double-edged sword. It can also bring you down. It can amplify your losses if you do make mistakes. So, you know, uh, be careful about incurring too much debt, uh, especially uh, if you're in an area whereby, you know, you're not going to get the cash flow uh, or if you're in an area where you're not going to get the appreciation. Because, uh, you know, over time, if the asset hasn't increased and uh, you're indebted, 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 if you have to get out, uh, then, you know, you don't have a whole lot of equity from which to sort of uh, negotiate with. So you may have to sell at a loss just to move on. So, uh, again, there are two types of debt. There's what I call good debt and bad debt. Uh, I'm talking about good debt, which is to acquire debt to buy, acquire appreciating assets like real estate. But again, just be careful about going over leverage, especially uh, if we hit into, like we're going through right now, a market downturn when prices aren't going up, or if they are going up, they are uh, going up slowly, or you may be in an area whereby price is actually going down. And now you've leveraged this asset, and uh, but the prices have gone down. So you're what we call underwater. And, uh, and if you're underwater, you're in a very precarious situation. You speak to anybody who was around in 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, uh, what it was like to be underwater. It's not a good feeling. A lot of people, if they're not careful, they just walk away and give the houses back or to the bank or just keep moving. So be careful about debt. If you can handle debt, it's great. If you can't handle debt, just be careful. Uh, one of the good ways... Uh, you know, especially if you're starting out, is to try to leverage the uh, the strategy, the house hacking strategy, whereby you can leverage, uh, you can use debt to actually find your primary residence. And therefore, if you're living in your primary residence, you can significantly reduce your housing expenses and uh, and therefore reduce your expenses because house housing expenses is one of the largest expenses that you have. So uh, that's a strategy. If you have, uh, if you want to, you know, sort of uh, reduce risk um, is to be able to acquire properties and you live there through the house hacking strategy. Okay, so that's number four. Number five is uh, don't start with a large scale renovation project. Um, rehabs can be very challenging. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts, uh, especially the more uh, ambitious, the more um, you know, major uh, the renovation becomes. You're gonna deal with contractors, you're gonna deal with permits, you're gonna have to deal with architects, you're gonna deal with electricians, HVAC, carpenters, roofers, and so on. There's just a lot of stuff. And it takes quite a bit of skills to manage a project like that. So what my recommendation and there's nothing wrong with buying houses that need work. But if you're just starting out, one way to reduce your risk is to start low and go slow, i.e. buy houses that require moderate, moderate or minor renovations. Uh, and therefore, you can sort of get your hands dirty uh, slowly but surely. Uh, so go slow and uh, develop those skills, management skills, if you feel that you can do it. Uh, it can be done. I mean, I did it. I was working full time. I still was able to buy some properties that require work. But it just means that you have to assemble a good team. You got to have some good contractors with you. You have to be able to manage the relationships. And uh, you also have to factor in uh, costs, unexpected costs, uh, costs that, uh, you know, unfortunately just comes with a territory in terms of uh, rehabs. One, one way that some people, um, go by is a strategy of what we, they buy what we call turnkey rental properties these are houses or properties whereby all the renovation is done and uh, so the uh the investor has uh, bought the house completed the renovations and then sells it to you you then take it over complete uh all the rehab is done and the other thing that and, and sometimes they even provide you with the tenant so you essentially buy a turnkey product with everything done for you. Uh, again, you know, it, I, I know it makes sense for some people. Uh, I know there's quite a few proponents of the turnkey strategy. I haven't personally done the turnkey, so I'm not going to 
you know, say anything good or bad about it. It's just that I like to force the appreciation. I like to get equity in the house uh, from day one. Whereas many times in turnkey operations or turnkey in properties, there's no equity because the previous investor has pretty much, uh, you know, taken all the equity out and providing you with a finished product uh, with a tenant inside. And hopefully the tenant will be uh, paying your rent and, uh, you know, doing okay. So I prefer the Burr strategy with a Section 8 twist because I can force equity. And, uh, and that strategy can be a, if, a extremely effective especially uh, during a downturn, whereby if you've got equity in the house, then you can sort of withstand uh, cycles a lot better. If you need to sell, at least you can sell because you've got some equity there. But if you've got no equity and, uh, you know, I said it's not easy uh, because you have very little uh, ability to, 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 you have very little lever leverage, really. If you sell, the chances are you're probably going to have to sell at a loss. Uh, so again, start with properties that uh, need only minor uh, repairs and uh, and gradually start tackling larger and larger renovations as you build your uh, trust with contractors and also your comfort in managing the contractors and also managing these types of properties. Again, these are, uh, I've given five uh, halfway through uh, of ways you can reduce your risk in, as a buy and hold investor, I kind of quickly went through the five so far. Invest for cash flow and appreciation. Uh, I know it's usually one or the other, but if you can go for both, you can definitely reduce your risk. Two, use conservative, conservative estimates for expenses. There's a lot of hidden expenses uh, as a buy and hold investor. A lot of people don't really factor those things in. So be careful and factor those expenses uh, in order to avoid surprises. Three, avoid low-end areas or low-end rentals. Uh, I know this is a little comp. Um, it's probably probably a little bit uh, what's the right word? Uh, debatable. And I just feel that uh, you know, if you got to start somewhere, you got to start somewhere. But if you can try to buy a house in better areas, you can usually attract better quality tenants. And those tenants, especially if you treat them well, tend to stay a lot longer. Now, I don't. I don't mean you got to buy the the top. A, a neighborhood no i'm just saying that uh, i've just had no success uh buying in war zones and other areas whereby it's just completely unsafe undesirable and things like that uh four be careful about over leveraging leveraging uh taking on debt if it's a double-edged sword uh if you can manage debt uh it's great because you can acquire a lot of properties uh using other people's money but the flip side is that the market tanks on you uh if you take if you incur too much debt it can really um you know hit you uh, as the saying goes um you know uh you don't want to be the guy standing up when the music stops when the music stops is the people who are it's usually the debt is what crush crushes most people uh they're taking on too much debt they can't pay the debt and therefore, the heavyweight of the debt is what crushes them down. Number five, uh, don't start with large scale renovations. Start small, work your way up. There's a lot of moving parts in uh, rehabs. So I would recommend that if you're just starting out, go with the minor proje uh, projects that require minor renovations and develop your team, develop your skill, develop your comfort level, uh, develop your management skills. And then slowly but surely, you can start building up. That's how I did it. And uh, now I have a great set of contractors and to the point whereby I really don't even have to manage them. They know what they got to do. I know what they have to do. We just get the job done. Oh, uh, kind of halfway through. So again, uh, if you got uh, uh, some questions for me, uh, we're going to go to the Q&A session uh, in about five or 10 minutes. So please line up your questions and I'll be more than happy to answer them for you. So please pull them on and uh, we'll get to them very, very shortly. That's your... Um, the question that you may have. Number six, tenant proof your property. We're talking about buying whole rent investing. Uh, yeah, you may want to tenant proof your, uh, I mean, tenants, they can wear and tear in your house and especially tenants from hell. Uh, they can bang the walls, scuff the walls, scratch the walls, scratch the hardwood floors, knock holes in, you know, I don't know, have barbecues in the house. I mean, they can destroy your house and I've been there, done that. It's not a great 
feeling you know grown-up kids um you know grown-ups uh, i mean pets children they can do a lot of uh you know wear and tear on your property so you know so as a as a buy and hold investor it's your job is to protect uh your property from damage and you can do that by tenant proofing your your units and uh, different ways you can do that you know i'll give you some examples uh, for me i use semi gloss paint uh, throughout my homes it's usually easier to wipe down uh, i'm now transitioning more to luxury vinyl planks uh or flooring there's a lot they're a lot more durable uh they can withstand uh, a lot of heavy traffic uh, much better than carpets or even hardwood floors so that's the trend i'm going through uh i get try to get better quality fixtures ones that don't break down every every couple of days you spend a couple of dollars more uh but get quality uh, you know fixtures uh tubs uh showers faucets you know that kind of stuff light fixtures just get better quality ones they tend to um you know last longer and they can take abuse are much better than some of the cheap ones where you think you're saving money but in reality you have to replace it uh, more often uh that's the physical uh repairs the, obviously the legal repairs which i'll probably talk about in a bit more detail later on is uh you want to tenant proof your property through legal channels by through having a good lease and uh also by um minimizing your exposure uh you know to you know to damage i through security deposits make sure you collect a security deposit uh and making sure that uh you know if uh you know if there are damages you can account for the damages and therefore you can get your you can take the money away from this uh, the tenant through the security deposits and things so the point i'm trying to get is that you can tenant prove your uh, property uh from a physical standpoint by having better quality better quality items better quality fixtures fish fittings um you know uh throughout your home and therefore you don't have to replace uh the items every so often for example i know uh before i used to buy carpet in all my homes and um it just seemed that every time a tenant leaves you know there was so much it was just so so hard to 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 remove the stains and scuff marks and scratches and all that kind of stuff for the carpet you literally had to replace the carpet again and again, every time, you know, and, and so on. It was just expensive. Uh, so now what I'm finding with vinyl planks, uh, especially the better quality ones, is that uh, they can withstand a lot of wear and tear uh, and abuse, uh, spills, drips, and things like that from the tenants. So again, tenant proof your property. It may cost a little bit more on the front end, but it's going to save you quite a lot on the back end. Uh, number seven is, uh, you know me on this one, uh, I learned this the hard way, the importance of screening. Screen, screen, screen your tenants. If you want to mitigate your risk, this is the one area where you can do that. Uh, in my opinion, 90% of most of your problems you're going to have as a landlord, a buy hold investor, is by having the wrong person in your home. And you can avoid having the wrong person in your home by screening properly. Um, you know the type of tenants that you're trying to avoid. The ones who say, hey, I'll pay the rent when I feel like it. You know, this is my property, so I'm going to do what I want to do. Uh, you know, those people that do what we call illegal activities. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of difficult uh, types of tenants. The ones that, if you're not careful, they will trash and destroy your cash flow. And uh, so what's the best way to do that? Screening. How do you do that? Different ways. I'll quickly uh, summarize some of the items which I do, which you all probably all know. And uh, I may have another session uh, just on screening. I do have a course on screening, in fact. Uh, which you can buy on my website um you know it's just all about screening and how to make sure you get what i call a tier one tenant uh but you start off with a rental application and um you know make sure you have a a, a solid rental application and also you have right right policies to screen um every applicant whether it be for credit uh criminal reports uh eviction reports uh check for income uh, check for rental history, current landlord, previous landlord. Even I do, I go to the next step and I actually go to the person's home uh, to do a, a home check to see how they keep their home. So that's what I do. 
Uh, I'm very, very thorough on my screen. I will not compromise this one. I do not outsource screening. Uh, I do it all myself. And, uh, and I've screened terribly in the past. I just took people on face value. What they told me, I took their word for it. And I learned the hard way that people lie, people cheat, people steal, people want to get over. And uh, if you want to know how your house is going to be in three months, you go to that person's home. If you want to know uh, what kind of landlord uh, their grief they're going to give you, you call the current and previous landlord, they'll tell you. So lots of things you can do um, you know, to reduce your risk here. Uh, but this is the important one is to screen, screen, screen your tenants. And I really don't want to minimize this. If you get this wrong, you're setting yourself up for disaster. So that's number seven. Number eight is my friends. Uh, let's have a look. Number eight is use a hyper protective lease agreement. Ha, ah, your lease. Yes, you know me. I got a 20 page lease. Uh, I think you can buy the lease also on the website. Um, this is a very important document. Uh, it's not all the be all and end all because I think the most important thing is the relationship you develop with your tenant. But it's also good to make sure you have a strong lease that protects you in the event you have to go to the legal channels through the courts. Um, you know, I don't believe in those leases that you get from Staples or, you know, Walmart or you know, or the, or the corner store. Nah, get yourself a proper document either uh, from um, an attorney. As I said, before, I have a 20 page lease that I have and uh, make sure it's a solid lease. And it, it, it complies with local uh, regulations wherever you are. But it's just so important to, to have it in writing and make sure that uh, you go through the important things with your tenant in terms of uh, do's and don'ts, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable behavior, uh, tenant rules, and uh, and so on. So for an example, uh, if you don't have, I know a lot of uh, landlords have difficulty with security deposits um, because when tenants leave, uh, all tenants want their you know, security deposit back, all of it, 100% of it. And uh, landlords will say, well, yes, not a problem, but you cause some damage here, you cause some damage there, and therefore I'm going to subtract um you know uh, a portion of your security deposit for non wear and tear items now you can get away with that if uh your lease allows it and or even if you've done what we what I call a moving checklist where you go through the house um you know beforehand and that should be documented as part of the moving process if you don't have that then you're going to have difficulty proving the condition of the house on day 1 before the tenant moved in and uh, and therefore, you may not be able to subtract anything because it's going to become he say, she say. The tenant's going to say, well, the house was like this before I moved in. And you're going to say, well, it wasn't. So now who's the right? So again, your lease will hold if you're able to document uh, the condition of the property uh, prior to the tenant moving in and any damages that was caused thereafter. So again, this is just one sample, simple, um, you know, uh, example of the importance of having a solid solid lease another area is uh, what we call guests uh what is the definition of a, te a guest uh if a tenant brings their you know friend in and they start moving in and they start living there are they a guest now or they are another tenant uh your lease should define that i don't mind us uh but if your lease doesn't define who's supposed to be there and who's not supposed to be there and uh, then you could have a, some difficulty getting that person out of there uh, because they may claim tenants uh, that they are a tenant or a guest or whatever it is. So there is a difference between the terms a guest and a tenant. So, again, this is where the lease comes in is the importance of having a real solid lease. I can never uh, reduce the importance of that. Uh, number nine, uh, automate your rent collection if you can. Uh, obviously one of the biggest risks that you're going to have as a landlord is people not paying your rent. Uh, there's some tenants who don't feel like it's their responsibility to pay you rent, even though they live in the house for free and, um, you know, and so on. So if you can automate that process as much as possible, uh, when I first started out, I used to knock on people's doors and collect my rent in person. Uh, yeah, believe it or that, Dr. used to do that. Knock on the doors, collect the rent. And you know what used to happen? I used to knock on the door. 
and all the lights will go out and I could hear them behind the door. Hey, shh, 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 the rent guy's here. And, uh, and so on. They won't open the door. When I left that five minutes later, all the lights will turn back on again. Yes, yes, yes. I don't do that anymore, obviously. And uh, I automate the entire process. Everything's done electronically. And uh, if you can even automate it, whereby it goes directly from their bank account, checking account, um, their pay stub, uh, you can automate the process whereby the money comes to you uh, automatically. If you can do that, that's great. But the next best thing, in my opinion, anyway, is to not collect cash, but have people deposit the money uh, either directly into your account or some kind of ACH transfer from their accounts to your account and uh, and so on. There are a lot of quite, there's quite a few online uh, rent collection uh, tools out there and platforms out there that can automate, that does automate that process. You may want to check into them. A lot of them are minimal cost, if not almost free. Uh, it could be worthwhile for you. And then finally, number 10 uh, is uh, prioritize tenant retention. Uh, this is, uh, you know me again, This I, I'm a big proponent of this. And uh, as I said before, what I've learned is that the biggest expense uh, that I incur uh is the cost of turnover uh the cost of vacancy of turnover where the person leaves you got to paint it again you got to clean it again you got to advertise again you got to go out and start looking for people it's very very expensive it's very time consuming and it can wipe out all your profits if you're not careful so uh to avoid that um you know i'm just a proponent of making sure my tenants are happy and uh i am a proponent of tenant uh customer satisfaction and uh, because if they are happy uh, with me as a landlord and the home and the neighborhood, they tend to stay longer. And uh, so essentially what I'm, what I'm saying is that I prioritize tenant retention. I want my tenants to stay. I don't want them to leave. And all the strategies I have, birthday gifts, Mother's Day cards, bouquets of flowers, free vacations, all that stuff is geared towards prioritizing tenant retention uh if i can avoid a person leaving then it means that the cash flow that uh, i get each month stays in my pocket because once they leave that cash flow gets wiped out so prioritize uh, tenant retention if you're good if you get good tenants keep them do what you got to do to retain your good tenants and um you know let them know that you care about them let them know that you value them and let them know that you appreciate for them um you know people people like that and uh checking with my checking with your tenants every now and then i do uh i try to check in with my tenants you know at least see them uh at least once every six months uh just check in or call them and see how they're doing make sure everything's okay and there are no issues uh and so on because if you don't if the next time around you hear any problems is is when you um receive a 30-day notice that they leave in and at that point it's too late uh something that you could have caught and addressed several weeks or several months ago is now too late they're moving on and now you have a vacancy and which means that you're gonna have a turnover and you're going to incur at least one month probably two or three months lost income because of something that you could have taken care of for minimal cost a few weeks a few months earlier Okay, so final thoughts. Uh, I know it sounds like a lot. I put a lot on you. Uh, I went through one to ten. Let's just quickly go through one through ten one more time, and then we'll go to the Q and A. So you got some questions? Please put in the Q and A. Uh, I'm going to go to the Q and A se section, session, section, yeah, uh, portion uh, right now. So number one, invest for cash flow and appreciation if possible. Number two, use conservative estimates for expenses. Number three. Avoid low-end rentals. Number four, these are ways to reduce your risk as a buy and hold investor. Be careful about over-leveraging. Number five, five is don't start with large-scale renovation projects. Start small, work up. And uh, six is tenant-proof your property. Don't always get the cheapest stuff. Uh, spend a bit more and you get more durable, longer lasting, which will eventually save you more money. Uh, screen, screen, screen your tenants. Number seven. Number eight is use, have yourself a great lease and uh, make sure your lease is extensive and not one of those one page, two page nonsense, I call them, 
that you can get from a local drugstore around the corner or a local supermarket. Uh, invest in a proper lease. I have leases on my website for sale and uh, and so on. Number That was number eight. This number nine is automate your rent collection. You want to try and automate that as much as possible. I'm not into knocking on people's doors trying to collect rent. Uh, you can have there's programs, there applications now uh whereby you can automate that process where funds can be transferred directly electronically from their account into your account and uh and so on quite a few online tools out there for you and number 10 prioritize tenant retention uh because at the end of the day uh you're dealing with human beings and uh, if you can make sure your tenants are happy they're going to pay you they're going to take care of your property they're going to be pleasant to deal with and more importantly they're going to stay a long time so again, the final thought is that uh, I know it's a lot that I put on you today, uh, but I wanted to share with you some of the the the, the strategies, some of the, um, the things that you can do to reduce your risk uh, as a buy and hold investor based on my 30, 35 years worth of experience as a buy and hold investor uh, through five real estate cycles through the ups and downs over the years. So this is words of wisdom, which I hope feels helpful. And uh, yes, there are risks associated with real estate investing, but it's not insurmountable. Uh, a lot of these things you can do. I didn't know when I when I first started out, but uh, I'm for the wiser, and and hopefully this is helpful for you. So with that said and done, uh, we're going to go to Q and A. So again, if you got some questions, please put them in your put them in the question uh, chat box, and I'll do my best to uh, to go through as many of them as we can. Uh, in the limited time that we have. Again, I've got a little sore throat, so I apologize if I have a very grog, grog, groggly, uh, hoarse, um, you know, voice today. Uh, it's a lot better than it was a couple of days ago, I'll tell you that. Anyway, so if you want to email me, you can reach me at joe at joeasimo.com, joe at joeasimo.com. And apologies if I don't always respond as, as, uh, as quickly as I should, uh, but bear with me. And uh, I took several days off this week just to relax, not do a whole lot of anything and, uh, you know, planning my next vacation. So anyway, let's go to the Q&A and see what's out there. So let's have a look, my friends. Number one, Ameth Amethyst, uh, you have the best strategy. Good for tenants, neighborhoods, cities, contractors and you. Guaranteed income and extremely low turnover. Thanks for all you do. Wow. That is, in a nutshell, what I do. That's, that's, that's a pretty good summary there, Amethyst. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the best strategy, but it's a strategy that works for me, and it's worked, um, you know, for the last 30, you know, 30, 35 plus years, and it's based on experience. I think it's a great strategy because you do, if you select, if you are able to screen for the best tenants, if you buy a house in, 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 in good areas, you can attract uh, better quality tenants, and when they when you, when you appeal to them, you take care of them. They tend to stay better. They tend to stay longer, and it's a win win for everybody. It's a win win for the neighborhood. It's a win win for the family. It's a win win for me. It's a win win for the banks. It's a win win for all the other stakeholders. And uh, you take care of your contractors. It's a win for them. You can't really do this without teamwork. And, uh, and I realized that it's not just about me. If I can make it a win for everybody else, then just by, you know, it's just by karma, I suppose, you tend to do better as well. And uh, throwing that at Section 8, guaranteed income, yep. And uh, extremely low turnover. I think you wrapped it up there, Amethyst. I like it. Okay. Uh, Sean Riley. What is your minimum cash flow per month after all expenses? Uh, it depends, Sean. Um, my first house that I bought, uh, I think I've shared this story many times. Uh, I had the tenants from hell. And I didn't know what I was doing. I inherited these tenants and they were giving me grief. Uh, they weren't paying me. And uh, all they gave me were excuses uh, as to why they weren't going to pay me. Uh, but I stuck in there, and believe it or not, at the time, I was making $50 in cash flow if they paid me. Uh, but, you know, I bought the house anyway, and uh, 
most people would say, well, why are you buying a house just for 50 bucks cash flow? It doesn't make any sense. Well, well, it probably didn't make sense, but I knew that over time, well, I didn't know, but I, I just assumed that over time, I probably could increase the rent. And I knew that over time, the value of the house is probably gonna increase. And, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, in the short term, it didn't make sense, but in the long term, I made a bet that it would make sense. So let's fast forward to that one. And the, the, the rent, as I said now, is 4,700. And, uh, you know, I bought the house like 47. It's now 700 and something. So it, it depends, it, uh, Sean. If you're, I'll just put it this way. If your cash flow can be met by other sources, i.e. a job or other income streams, then you don't have to put all the weight on the real estate, okay? Because you're not living off the real estate. I mean, so the example I've given is the one I, the, the house I had for $50. I wasn't trying to live off that $50. I had a job and therefore my day-to-day -day cash needs were being met by my job. But I also was doing house hacking as well. I mean, they didn't call it house hacking uh, when I, at that time. It was just, from my perspective, how could I buy a house whereby I didn't have to pay to live there? So I bought this house and had roommates, and essentially I lived there for free. Uh, I think Brandon Turner was the one who coined up the word house hacking, uh, but I was doing house hacking before house hacking was invented. Uh, it's been going on for forever. Uh, how do you subsidize the cost of housing? But anyway, the point is, is that... Um, you know, I didn't rely on my job for my, sorry, I didn't rely on the house as my, uh, for the cash flow. I was able to get the cash flow from other sources. And as a result of that, I was okay with $50 of cash flow, if that makes sense. So if your cash flow needs can be taken care of elsewhere in others, uh, by other vehicles, then you don't need a lot of cash flow for your uh, house, especially when you're first starting out. But over time, uh, you can increase the rent. Over time, you can pay down the mortgage. Over time, you know, the asset will increase. And uh, what I did for my house was I was able to get home equity lines of credit and then use that one asset to buy more houses. So I kind of did it in a, back, a roundabout way, but that wouldn't have happened if I didn't just bite the bullet and buy this house. So minimum cash flow, it depends on you. Uh, I think everyone's different. And uh, depending on if you've got cash flow, if your cash flow needs are being met elsewhere versus just on this property. So I kind of give you, uh, you know, a response which may not answer, it may not be the, the right answer that you're looking for, but it, it just depends on your situation, uh, Sean, and, uh, and so on. Let's have a look. Uh, Sean, how often do you inspect a property over the course of the year with a tenant? Wow, good question, Sean. You're on a roll. Uh, it depends, uh, when I first, uh, for the first year, typically first year, it's going to be at least once every three to six months. Okay. For the first year. And during that time, you can get to know the tenant, you can get to know how they keep the property. And then if the tenant's doing well, they're keeping the property up, then you can kind of reduce the number of times you need to go there. Uh, you can educate the, the tenant in terms of what you're looking for in terms of, um, you know, uh, how they keep the property and things like that. So that could be something. Uh, so to answer your question for the first year, it could be, uh, you know, two, let's say, let's just say two, two times per year, uh, once every six months. And then based on, uh, how the tenants taking care of the property, uh, during your initial inspections, you can then weigh whether you need to continue every six months or do it every once a year. That's up to you. Okay. Uh, I like to give a little thank you gift if I go to the home and uh, they pass. Um, I used to give me like 50 bucks as a thank you a gift for um, taking care of my property. And also, um, you know, yeah, that's what I do anyway. Sean again. Oh, my goodness, Sean, you're on a roll. Okay, if you got some questions, put them in the chat box. Uh, I'm going to see if I try to get to them before the end. 
Um, and uh, and then we'll see what again. What is the minimum credit score you will accept? Oh, my goodness, Sean. Uh, it depends. Again, um, what I found is that for voucher holders, um, you know, a lot of the voucher holders that I come across, they don't really have that great tenant, uh, great tenant, great uh, credit. Uh, they're good people, uh, but you know, life happens, and uh, people make some, you know let's just say, uh, mistakes in terms of their credit. And uh, so, you know, it's not that important for me, for voucher holders. Now, for market renters, yes, it's very important because uh, with voucher holders, you've got the, your, your rent is backed by the government, which has got AAA credit, okay? And uh, having done the Section 8 program for the last 35 years, there's never been a month where I haven't been paid. Uh, as long as the tenant's in there, I'm getting my money from the uh, housing authority. So that's triple A credit. Uh, so although the tenant doesn't have triple A credit or low score, the guarantor of the rent has triple A credit. So that kind of offsets, if that makes sense. Whereas you don't have that luxury with market renters. And therefore, you have to have make sure that the, the, the market renter has decent credit and has a rich history of paying their rent. OK, so uh, essentially what I'm saying, Sean, is that for voucher holders, I could be a lot more relaxed uh, on the credit requirements, credit score requirements, because there's a guarantor which has triple A credit. OK. And I know a lot of the management companies, I think for market renters, uh, what they they usually like some like 720 and higher. Uh, but I don't really have those requirements for voucher holders. I will have that for market renters though. And uh, because their rent is not guaranteed, it's based on their income and their ability or willingness to pay. Hope that answers that question, Sean. Uh, so again, it just depends and uh and so on okay next one is miss lauren devilia hi lauren uh hi dr joe hope you're doing well is there more risk involved if you accept a voucher holder that has a voucher for a different number of bedrooms than the one that your home has uh so i think you have a follow-up question for example if a tenant has a voucher for four bedrooms but your home has three bedrooms. Okay. So the scenario that Lauren, again, if you got good question, Lauren, uh, if you got some questions, please put them in the chat box. I'm going to be wrapping up soon. My voice is getting a little uh, hoarse. So I'll keep talking until uh, I can't talk anymore, uh, but put them in. Okay. So, um, so Lauren describes a scenario whereby she has a house and, um, so she has a three bedroom house. Okay. And a tenant comes in there with a voucher, which is a four bedroom voucher. And essentially, what's happening is that the voucher holder is downgrading. Uh, you got a three bedroom, but they have a four bedroom house. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It's within the rules. As long as your rent is, um, uh, what's it called? priced at the three bedroom level, then the four bedroom voucher holder will be allowed to move in. Now you can't price your three bedroom home at a four bedroom price because you're rented to a four bedroom voucher holder. You, they won't allow that. Uh, it's got to be, it's a three bedroom, therefore your rent has to fit within the three bedroom guidelines. So, uh, so you can definitely rent to a a four bedroom voucher holder if you have a three bedroom voucher if you have a three bedroom house now with that said uh it means that let's just say let's say hypothetical uh, and i know this won't apply in your situation but let's just keep it simple for everyone to understand lauren let's say you have a three bedroom house and um there's the head of household they take one bedroom and there are, uh, it's got a four bedroom voucher. So let's just say they've got three kids. So there's four people all together. Just keep it simple. 
uh, so the head of household takes one room and uh, you got a three bedroom house, which means that two, there's only two bedrooms left, but there's three more people. So two of those people are gonna have to double up in one of the bedrooms, that makes sense. Uh, that's okay. If they're okay with that, it's, it could be okay with you. It's not a problem. The problem, uh, Lauren, is that as time goes by, the people who are doubling up may want their own space. And so they may outgrow your house, uh, you know, quicker, if they, especially if they know where there's space in your home where they can, uh, you know, have their own room, for example. So the only downside with what you're describing, Lauren, is the fact that at some point, the family may leave your home and move into a four bedroom home because they have a four bedroom voucher. They can qualify for more space than what your house offers. So they may move into your property uh, initially because that's all they can find. But as time goes by, they may start looking elsewhere because they know they can qualify for a larger home. So that's the only downside, Lauren, uh, if you offer your three bedroom home to a four bedroom voucher holder. Again, I'm not saying that it's gonna happen. I'm just saying there's a possibility that could happen. They may not stay as long as they would be because they're really, they, they are looking for a four bedroom house. And the only reason why they're going to your house is because they can't find one or they, or the other option is that they could be able to create a fourth bedroom somewhere uh, in your home and, and maybe okay with that. So they, you, for instance, you may have a rec room and they could decide, well, instead of being a rec room, we'll turn that into another bedroom and, uh, and that will be our quote unquote fourth bedroom. Although it's not legally a fourth bedroom, they're going to use it as a fourth bedroom and therefore they're okay with that. So hopefully that. So it's definitely allowable in the, in, in the rules, uh, but just based on the experience, uh, I found that uh, people when they downgrade their voucher, they usually don't stay too long. They may stay a year or two or three, uh, but ultimately they're looking for something bigger. Okay, good question today. Uh, L. Addison, uh, can you talk about home warranties that will help you with maintenance? Do you think of purchasing one is a good idea? Uh, good question, uh, L. Uh, yes, uh, I have home warranties in all my properties. And, uh, you know, home warranties, I mean, that's a whole other discussion. Um, I'll probably do a session on that um, alone. Maybe I'll do that one, one, one of the Wealth Wednesdays, just talk about home warranties. There are home warranty companies all over the place. Some of them are literally scam artists. And uh, all they like to do is take your money, but don't want to actually deliver any service. Um, so I'm not going to say which one I use, but let's just say that uh, I, I've had my battles with them. And uh, you got to know how to play the game with these guys. Otherwise, it's an exercise in frustration. So I just do it for, for, for convenience. So if something goes wrong right now with uh, uh, an appliance, I don't have to go scurrying around trying to find an appliance technician. I can just call the home warranty company and they'll assign it to an appliance company it's taken care of. Uh, last week at one of my houses, there was a, quite a few plumbing issues. Uh, the tenant called me, I called the American, I, I called the, uh, the home warranty company and um, they assigned it to a plumbing company and uh, the plumbers came out there, took care of the problem, or it did cost me the service fee. So it's just convenience and uh, also it's outsourced. So again, it could work for you, especially if you don't have your team and systems in place, but it's worked for me and uh, I have them on all my properties. That's the, uh, the home warranties. Good question. Uh, do you think it's purchasing one is a good idea? It, it's gonna depend on you. Um, you know, again, I've had some mixed experiences with the home warranties and some of them work, some of them don't work, but uh, we'll see. Okay, I think it's now eight o'clock, so I gotta wrap it up. Uh, this is the last question, Lauren, you got it. Uh, on the application process, do all adults need to be listed as applicant? Yes, anyone over 18 should be on the on the uh, on the application. Um, now if it's a they should be on the application, uh, they should be on the lease, and uh, you should also do your credit checks on them. Uh, you know, that's that's my recommendation anyway. Uh, now the voucher 
is if you have a voucher holder, typically the voucher is held by the head of household, but on the voucher itself uh, are listed all the occupants uh, of the house. And therefore those occupants should be on the lease. That way you don't have strange people living in your house who say they live there when they really shouldn't be there. So I like to let, make sure I know who's supposed to be on there and they should initially be on the application uh and they should also be on the lease as an occupant of the property okay it is now eight o'clock my friends and uh it's 801 so i want to wrap it up today i didn't think it was going to we'll do the full hour but we did hopefully it was helpful today we're going to do another session next wednesday uh 7 p.m so today i uh, hope you found today's uh, session interesting sure did Again, if you want to reach out to me, please uh, reach out to me. You can send me an email uh, at joe at joasimo.com. So we will hear you all. Uh, did I... Yep, there it is. So you can reach me out here, uh, joe at joasimo. Shoot me an email, and I'll see if I can try to respond. Uh, I, I've, I'm, I'm not the, the best at returning emails, so I apologize for everybody who's shot me emails and i haven't responded but i'll try my best to be to be better and uh but it's all good so again uh i want to see everybody hopefully next wednesday 7 p.m eastern time on uh, for another wealth wednesday have yourself a wonderful evening take care bye for now